The following podcast contains mature language and spoilers. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Zero Edition of the Marvel Superheroes Podcast. This is essentially a virtual mixer to give us a chance to introduce you to your hosts and as a way for us to work out some of the kinks before we officially start releasing episodes. The audio quality is not the best and I apologize for that, but if you are willing to suffer through it, I think that it'll be an entertaining little episode. I hope you enjoy it. I'm Diablo Frank. I'm forcing you guys to take on aliases and we're going to try our best to actually stick with that. Illegal Machine or Mac and Mr. Fix-It. Or fix. Now I'm going to start with you, Mac. How did you get into comic books? We lived in northern Arizona for a while. My family lived in Flagstaff, Arizona. There was a comic book store there. Strike Zone was the name of the comic book store slash baseball card shop. And I was going in there originally for baseball cards and eventually made my way into the second room, which contained comic books. And I just got some cheapos and went from there. Now, did you get into comics before your brother did? Might have been around the same time. No, I think that we just hung around the same places and then... And he would, because he always kind of went off and did his own thing. If you're yeah. both there, he's going to find some stuff. Yeah, that's if he and I collected the same stuff, you can mm-hmm. kind of probably infer that, but we never collected it. No, no, I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't yeah. even trying to say that. I know you guys better than that. You said you bought some cheapy comics. Do you remember what the first books you tried to pick up on were? No way. I know it's weird that I don't remember what comic books I started with first. I should clarify that we went through some family stuff. So I actually ended up, I don't have those comics anymore. So whereas normally if I were actually still in my possession, it'd probably be a little, little easier to remember. I do not have them anymore, which is why I don't remember them. I remember that I think one of the first comics I bought was a Superman comic, oddly enough, because I do not like Superman. But I remember seeing it on a rack in a, it was a stop-and-go-ish style gas station, bent to hell, because it was one of those spinning metal racks. I want to say, you'll probably know, I don't know if it was Superman, the cover was basically like a red sun exploding, and his almost like silhouette in front of it. I know if, if I would it, Was it after cover, Rain? Rain the Superman after he got. Mm, did he have the mullet? He, no. It may not. It may. When, was he deformed in some way? It may have even been. Mm, it's not coming to me. I can picture it in my head, but I can't, you know, describe it. Can, can you think of the artist? Oh, good lord, no. Okay. Pro, I mean, I assume it was Jurgens, right? I assume okay. it was Dan Jurgens, but that's only because of Superman in the early mid 90s, so that was probably the first comic book I ever bought. So, yeah. That, what possessed you? I, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm in the kind of the same boat. You always bought the things that were familiar to you. Growing up in the 70s and early 80s, that meant that I was familiar with the Christopher Reeve Superman, the Hulk, the Nicholas Hammond Spider-Man, Adam West, Batman. So those were the books. I, I didn't buy Hulk, because fucking Hulk, ugh. But I did buy Spider-Man, right. I did buy, and of course Captain America, they had the uh, the TV movies that were coming out with Cap, and that was one of the ways in which I was familiar with him. Of the Lost collection, that's one of the things that stands out too, is that we had those, t- what was that terrible Spider-Man miniseries where they put those refractive covers on... They were all, it was like, they were, one was a red, one was a green, one was a blue, and it had the webbing. Oh, yeah, 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 I know what you're With the about. hologram in the yeah, middle. Yeah, yeah, in the center. Right, right, so I, I remember, got those. I remember <laughs> I had that complete, those, I don't remember what it was, four or five, whatever, um, and those were gone, and then, it's so weird that all, all my memories of these comics were all characters that I hate, because I'm not a huge Spider-Man fan. My other one was, uh, I had the first, like, run, like, complete story arc that I ever purchased completely was the return of the Sinister Six which was a spy and, and was that Eric Larson? I think it was, I yeah, think okay. it was. Anyway, so that was like a big deal to me that I was actually able to get because it would say I think it's on the cover one of six or whatever mm-hmm. and I was actually yeah, I finished the whole thing I had them all so I think that was that was part of the yeah, that was like Dreadstar and Company for me. Is I, I lived to make sure I got that one book. It was my favorite book coming out of the time. But because of newsstand distribution, there was no guarantee you could ever get consecutive issues. So like that and the Death of Gene DeWolf from Spectacular Spider-Man, that first Peter David arc, the fact that I got all four parts of that one and all six parts of Cap- uh, Dreadstar and Company, it was a big deal for me because you didn't necessarily get to complete a set very often in those days. Yeah, it, it was so hit and miss back then. It was so hard. I don't think, you know, people collecting today probably have forgotten how difficult it was to collect. Mr. 
Mr. Fix-It. Do you remember when you started reading comic books? I guess my first book was a G.I. Joe comic. What about, would you me. say? 87. 87, er, okay. Yeah, about 86. Well, just, I just remember mine because I remember the cover. I remember okay. going what was to the, the cover? stop and go. It's the Joes are all jumping and Snake Eyes is kind of in like a crotch position in the corner. Um, I couldn't tell you any more than that. I just remember Snake Eyes really stood out to me. Back in those days, you could walk to stop and go and not be kidnapped or stranger <laughs> danger or any of that shit. We would go and hang out at the stop and go that was like five streets down and play video games. That's what we went there to do. They just happened to have some comics. Like, I, you know, very rarely would you find anything cool. I remember, you know, we'd flip through the, the magazines trying to find nudie pictures of anything we could get a hold of. Or, you know, Heavy metal was our porn in the Oh, yes, day. very much so. And I bought many at Walgreens. They never <laughs> carted. Yeah. God bless Walgreens. You know, we would go there and of course you would always hope that someone had opened the Playboy and dropped it behind the Lowrider magazine or something. So, flipped through it. It was kind of interesting. So, I read the G.I. Joe, got into it. My family was kind of like, cool, you're, you know, you're reading something so why don't you keep reading them so i would you know i would get a dollar here or there and i'd go buy some comics i really didn't get i didn't really get immersed into comics until i have a, a step uncle who's he's kind of a he looks like john belushi thinks like jim morrison really weird you know over sexed everything i remember he came to a family event and he had a third planet bag and i was like what's that and he's like these are comics and he you know pulled them out and that's when i saw my first x-men comic he even had a uh, two two hot girls one horny night or some kind of adult comic oh, in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Fantagraph, or the Eros book. Yeah, yeah, Eros book. So he had all this stuff in his bag, and so I started reading them. I would say, like, I, I, I sporadically read comics, but, like, you remember back in the day at Stop and Go, you would go up there, yeah. and you were lucky if they had back-to-back-to-back-to -back -to -back -to issues. Mm -hmm. So I would buy Spider-Mans, but I always had huge gaps. For it to really hook me was never there. Mm -hmm. I would read, you know, you read this great Green Goblin story arc, and you couldn't find two missing parts. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't go to comic shops. I remember I used to buy my ex back issues at Grumpy's. Mm -hmm. You remember Grumpy's? Yeah, the video those, store, right? Yeah, they yeah. had those comic boxes in the center. Mm -hmm. So I would go in there and I'd buy them. God, they had comic. When was this about? Was that the early '90s? Was this like yeah, the early '90s? Okay. Yeah. Di okay, so okay, well, then I say I, I guess it would say like '88, '89. Mm -hmm. That's when Grumpy's would have comics. Because I remember seeing like all kinds of old comics there, and you know, and they sold them dirt cheap. So we'd rent our movies. I'd grab a couple of comics, and that was kind of our Friday night at my mm -hmm. house, so my mom could keep an eye on us. Every once in a while, I would go up to drive up to the city, and I would go up to uh, Phoenix Comics or Bedrock. No, Be oh, no, no, Third Planet. And uh, even then, my dad would take us, kind of like to shut us up. So, yeah, so I was reading next one for quite a while. And, of course, we would go to NAMS, but I went more to NAMS just to, like, because those dudes were really fucking weirded out. It was just kind of cool to walk in there. And, <laughs> well, that's like, why you call it NAMS in the first place instead of NAMS. Is it? I, dude, it reminds me of Vietnam, dude. I walk in there. I walk in. Dude, it's like they're still stuck in the 60s. The scary part is I went. I took some friends there not too long ago. And. There's you and me there, dude. Like, there's literally two guys. That's why I Mike closed the shop. There, I did not want to be the guy who was in the shop in his 60s. I saw that shit. And I was like, 40s. oh, my God. It would have been a murder-suicide pact. I would have done that for you, my friend. So, well, I mean, every damn comic shop in this town is run by guys who used to shop with me now. I can't go to any of these shops without running into my former customers. So it, it's – I didn't want to – I wanted to break this cycle. <laughs> I don't have a good clear-cut story like you guys because there were always just comic book stuff around from when I was a kid. My uncle collected comics that he'd left over in the house that I got to read. My mother occasionally read comics, and she often would buy me comic-related items like the first Captain America thing I had. I don't even think it was a comic. I think it was a coloring book that was originally published in the 60s, and I'm sure they picked it up in a you know, five and dime. And uh, so for me, it was Cap and Batch Rock, and the Super Adaptoid was that, that introduction. From there, he was in cartoon guest appearances. Eventually, I started buying the comic books in the early 80s. The guy like the J.M. DeMatisse and Mike Zeck run. Marvel Team Up often would have him in it. There was always something, but when you mentioned the family troubles and losing a bunch of your comics, one that's memorable for me is I had a trade paperback before they were called them trade paperbacks, I don't think. Yeah. And it was uh, Captain America's Sin of Liberty. had an orange background, and it was a painted cover. I think it was originally out in the late 70s, but I got it from a B. Dalton bookseller in the early, early 80s. Uh, and again, it was in a situation where my stepfather was probably trying to placate me. I love the book. It was a wonderful introduction to the, the character and his early adventures and getting a sense, again, the strength. I love the strength of stuff was in there as well, which was great for me because I was already familiar with him from Strange Tales. Who we recently met, by the way, Jim Strange. Yeah, very cool, very cool guy. Yes, very, very sweet. Very, much cooler than I'd expect. Yeah. Well, you'd think somebody who's got such a larger-than-life persona, your natural inclination is to want to poke a hole in it. Then when you meet him and you talk to him, he's just such a 
great guy. It's like, oh man, have I ever said anything bad about Jim Steranko? For starters, I'm an idiot because he's an artistic genius, but yep. also he's such a wonderful person that you makes you feel terrible if you ever did such a thing. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So, and I had that trade paper back, and it went into a storage unit probably around 1984 or so. Nothing from that storage unit ever came back out again into our possession. Do you remember your first exposure to Iron Man? Nope. I just, I, I don't know, maybe I just got introduced to him at the right time. You remember about how old you were? This was probably 1991, mm -hmm. 1992. Any, with anybody who discovers their favorite character, they just happen to get the right back issue at the right time. Didn't see bad stuff. You eventually started collecting Iron Man. Yeah. Do you recall roughly when you started collecting the book on a regular basis? I mean, it would have been whatever was coming out in 91, 92. That was before Lee Kaminsky, right? Which not was not the too far before then, though. But this was after Michelini and Layton, right? Yeah. Kaminsky, to a large degree, though, was kind of your gateway guy. Since yeah. he's like one of the first guys you can actually remember the run. Well, that would have been the first, like, concurrent stuff. Like, where I'm actually collecting it as it was coming out. But before that stuff came out, I'd already gone back and scooped up Micheline and uh, Layton stuff and got into that. About how many years would you say you collected actively? Because you started to set around 91. You probably ended around the time I closed the oh. shop in 02. Two, roughly yeah then really haven't had any contact with comics since then no at one point in time you were a fan of magnum pi i could kind of see some parallels between magnum pi and tony stark yeah you for see sure that as well oh yeah for sure definitely do you think that you're fat because magnum pi i think you were into before tony too do you think one fed into the other um i don't think so i mean i don't know the, i think the kind of cockiness the cool cockiness is, is was is definitely something they have in common i don't know i mean other than they're both mustachioed I'm not sure how much further the similarities go beyond there. I mean, I'm both, well, they're both playboys, I guess, right? They both have black buddies that are always helping them out of the jams they're getting into. They both live an extravagant lifestyle full of beautiful women, but in the case of Tony Stark, he earned it, where Magnum just sort of got to borrow it. And like you said, the, the swagger, the looks, the attitude, it's nice to see a hero who enjoys what they're doing. Right. I'd say that probably the thing that appealed to me more than Iron Man itself was Tony Stark. I thought Tony Stark was a real... He was just different. You know, you had you had Peter Parker, who was the wussy nerd, and you have Bruce Wayne, who was super rich, but he was all... He was mentally scarred and all messed up. Whereas Tony Stark was... He acted more the way you would think somebody who was a multimillionaire should act. Like, so he had fun with his money. He had big houses. He had big cars. He was always dating the hottest women. He was super arrogant. He had Rhodes, who was his buddy, who was black, who, who was a, that's also different from a lot of other comic books. Well, that and while I'm a Cap guy, I've never liked the Falcon. He always just felt like the PC insertion into the series. Where Rhodey, and this has definitely been carried over into the movies, Rhodey feels like a vital part. Right. More right. so than, like, I don't know how much of the 1960s stuff you went back and read, but I guess that you had the happy pepper dynamic back then. But all the stuff that I've read that you've loaned to me and all the stuff I've been exposed to, it's Rhodey. Rhodey's the guy that hangs out with Tony Stark, and these other people are just sort of in, more in the background. Yeah, and, and Rhodey was his muscle. He was his partner. They were friends. So he, he really relied on Rhodey. Rhodey was a, was a straight-up friend in the book. I haven't read tons of Batman, but I would think that a lot of times... Robin didn't feel like Batman's friend. They're just weird. It's, Those like, characters have a very uncomfortable relationship right. because you would think that a ward and the mentor, you would have a more parental relationship. But they're kind of siblings, and then there's these weird jealousies and these protective things that go on. Yeah. Just a, a jacked-up codependency between these people that are both emotionally scarred, but Batman more so than any of his wards. Tony and Rhodes work together as two adults that have interests and desires beyond this singular notion that someone like Batman and Robin would have. And even his female relationships were more realistic, I think, in a lot of ways that, you know, you had the whole Pepper happy thing, and you had the Tony Pepper thing, and then you, his relationships with Black Widow, and Bethany Cabe, and Madame Mask, you had that kind of romantic side to it, brainy villains like uh, Justin Hammer, you had the, the, the Russian side to it with Titanium Man and Crimson Dynamo. You had the awesome Obadiah Stane story arc. He wasn't perfect. He had his his alcoholism that was always there. Just all those things. I just was thought he was always there, or just there since like the Bronze Age. I mean, he did, well, was he drinking like that back in the '60s, or was that more in the '80s? You know, I can't honestly. I I can't tell you the truth that I remember exactly when it started. Your um, relationship with Tony means that you started with the alcoholism, right. so you're familiar with that issue with him throughout your fandom. Right. So, I mean, going back, because obviously I would have been going backwards in time, so still a lot of the things you know from the character 
at the time you're reading will exist even though you're reading backwards before it happened it still stays with you as a character trait well it's like me when i was introduced to captain america he only had a few adventures with bucky and then bucky was gone and i'm not used to bucky being around it disturbs me to see how much bucky is around nowadays because that's not the captain america i grew right. up on i grew exactly. up with him hanging out with a whole bunch of other people and this guy was supposed to be dead his whole thing was he was a dead guy that cap warned and now all of a sudden he's all over the place Right, exactly. So then, uh, on the other hand, you also had the business side of it. That was a whole other layer of Tony Stark's being that could be threatened was the business side. And, and his relationships with S.H.I.E.L.D., there was references to the Danger Room and X-Men being built by Stark technology. You know, so he had all these little fingers everywhere in the Marvel Universe. And it just sucked. See, I, he... I didn't realize, because I know Stark technology is all over the movies. I didn't realize how embedded it was in the Marvel Universe as well. I knew about S.H.I.E.L.D., and I knew every now and again there'd be some bit of tech that would show up in a book that I was reading, but I, didn't, I wasn't aware that he was that prolific within the Marvel Universe. Yeah, and I want to say it was real early that they discussed Stark technology being used in the Danger Room. Like, that wasn't something that was added later on. I think, I want to say that was really early. I'll have to double check and back that up, to back that up. I gotta tell you, I like that a lot better than it being sentient Shi'ar technology that breaks away eventually and becomes a character unto itself. Good lord. Which they did I, that in the comics. I, I didn't know if you knew about that. Uh, it sounds familiar. I, I just thought all the diff those different layers of the character, it just sucked because a lot of the time when I was a fan of him, he wasn't being utilized right. You know, it, it's just a shame. So that's why, and I know you feel the same with Cap, and I feel the same with Cap too for, for actually all the Avengers, that it freaks me out when I have little Iron Men coming to my door for Halloween, and I have more Iron Men coming to my door than I have spider man or Superman or Batman, you know what I mean? Well, it's weird because me and Mr. Fixit grew up reading X-Men, and when we started reading, they were still somewhat the underdogs. They were the, the alternative to the, the more iconic Marvel heroes. And obviously that paradigm shifted in the 80s to the point where the X-Men were the end-all, be-all for a lot of people in comics. They A lot of people who came into comics came in specifically for X-Men, and only later branched out with like stuff like Dark Knight Returns and such. So the X-Men became the idealized heroes, and the iconic Marvel heroes became the underdogs, and now it's flipped again, and it's so, kind of disorienting, because you're, you're not expecting to see your guys get represented. You expect them to be the guys who maybe in continuity matter, but to the greater world are these old school things that nobody cares about anymore, but now everybody cares about them. Right, exactly. And so, especially for someone like me, who's been, I've, I've been away for so long, that when, when I left Iron Man, he was no more popular than he was when I started reading Iron Man. If, if, you know, if anything, he was even less popular when I left. So to, to just see the explosion since the movies came out, it's and I've been away long enough that I can sit back and watch the movies and not be mad about, you know, oh, you know, that, well, they should have stuck to this. This isn't like the books. I don't get bothered about stuff like that. Well, I mean, a good example is Sam Rockwell as Justin Hammer. Oh, I love yeah. that performance, but I know that is in no way the character from the comics. Exactly. Or Whiplash. Stuff like, Whiplash is a throwaway villain. There could have been so many other villains they could have used. The Mandarin being, well, spoilers, not the Mandarin. Stuff like that would have really bothered me. And now I just am able to kind of sit back and enjoy the movies and, and hopefully enjoy what other people are enjoying. Did you Except, ever get around to watching that uh, Marvel one-shot that followed Iron Man 3? No, I haven't. That followed Mandarin into prison? No, I haven't. You, you really got to find that and give it a watch. It's, it's outstanding. It's one of the best ones they've done. And for you being an Iron Man fan, I think it'll help your enjoyment of... It, it won't fix Iron Man 3's problems for you, but it'll give you a little something to per, you know, perk you up the next time you think about the Mandarin. Which, while we're talking, we should establish, I really enjoyed Iron Man 2. I really did not care for Iron Man 3, which is the opposite of uh, public opinion. So, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I can see off too, Because if you came in in the early 90s, and you're becoming an Iron Man fan, both from the series as it's currently running and going back and picking up the back issues, you weren't very deep into you know, following this book on a regular basis before you got hit with The Crossing, before you know, Heroes uh, Reborn. You didn't get to appreciate your guy for nearly as long as most people get to in their golden age because he was getting trashed almost as soon as you were coming into the book. Oh, yeah, and, and, and what was it? Uh, Infinity Crisis? Infinity Crusade? He turned out to be the big, the doppelganger that was working for... Or was it the Magus that was in that one? It might have been the Magus. I can't what get into those series straight anymore. It must have, I think it was the Magus because the, it was a Crusader War where they had the... the dupe. I can't remember, for God's sake. Those things just ran into one another. Yeah, but I, I just remember how... I mean, I didn't even read the whole series. I just remember when they when they revealed Iron Man was the one that had been abducted, or he was the doppel the original doppelganger. You know, you probably cut all this out because uh, I'm not remembering enough of these details. But it, would, it just showed the disrespect to me for the character because Wolverine would never be the one that was 
you know, Wolverine has to be the hero, whereas they felt that Iron Man was the one that they could take the pass on and uh, and uh, have be the turncoat, essentially. But, anyway. <laughs> What got you into the Hulk? Oh, the TV show, dude. It used to come on, what, Channel 39, wasn't it? 39, I don't 26. recall. I, I remember seeing it as a kid. I want to say 26, but I can't say you, for you're certain. You're probably right. It's probably 26. Yeah. Not would always watch the Hulk on there. And then I remember one time. And But I, well, when would that be time-wise? Though? Would that have been in the 80s and the 90s? Yeah, what? mid-80s. The cartoon, the early 80s cartoon. The one that came on after Amazing Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider -Man that, Amazing one, Friends? that yeah. one was really, well, because it was Savage Hulk. It was hey, Angry great Hulk. theme, too. Yeah. I, I was li looking to, when I was doing the the, the intro song for the podcast, yeah. I was listening to that, and that was one of the best theme songs. Yeah. I really wish they hadn't taken away from when it. I, it was so ominous. I have it's like a horror movie. Well, there's funny, because I have the bootleg one and so I was watching it and I forgot how dark some of those stories are there's one where he's fighting I guess an android type character and he smashes his body to the point where it's only the head and then the head grows legs and starts crawling away from him and he goes after trying to stomp it I'm just like god now the one that was really really dark was the one that came out in the 90s do you remember that one that oh. one was very psychological it reminded me if you recall on Batman the animated series they didn't have Two-Face come out immediately they built up to the introduction yeah. of Two-Face and they showed a lot of surrealistic imagery of Harvey Dent slowly going that. It struck me that the opening sequence to that Incredible Hulk mirrored that, and there was a lot of the Peter David stuff, especially the second season intro. Once they got She Hulk and the Gray Hulk and all yeah. the other guys over there, they put a lot of that psychological stuff into that second series. Well, actually, you turned me more onto the Hulk because you introduced me to Peter David. If I remember so correctly, so you you actually weren't collecting the Hulk before you were coming to the. I, the I would, but it was always the Jeff Purvis artwork. Mm -hmm. oh, no, that was even that was still Peter David though. I mean, the early stuff was okay, but it was very, you know, it's it's early. Well, for me, Hulk was the book that you got stuck with. Like, if I were trading comics with my friends, I always, the, the, the things you hated were Commandi, pretty much anything Kirby, Devil Dinosaur, yeah. 2001, well, and no, those Hulks, because everything, Hulk was about the freak of the month. He was always fighting a harpy or some oh, yeah. stupid crap like that, and it was monotonous, it was repetitive, it was, it was formulaic. Well, I, I hated the Hulk back then. I think then. I read a couple, of, I mean, I, I always liked the character and the idea behind the character. Well, could be, probably from the familiarity because yeah. you've been seeing the show, the you, show you were a fan of the show and you just received yeah. that reflected in the comics. Well, like most kids, you know, it's the advertising that gets you, the character, but you don't really know the backstory. I knew some of the backstory from the cartoons. I did buy some of the comics and, I mean, they were okay. I mean, they weren't. The artwork was always great. Machine was awesome, but if you read one Hulk story, you got the gist of the next six issues. They didn't really stretch the character. Not until about Peter David got it. And I think the first one I ever bought was at a Walgreens. I don't know if you remember, you could buy three comics in a plastic bag. Oh, sure. Yeah. I grew up on that. I think the early 90s was probably the tail end of them bothering to do that anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I remember they had, at Walgreens, they had the three comics, and they had the Hulk versus the X-Factor, a Spider-Man book, and an X-Men book. And I really liked it. I was reading the X-Men books. It was Claremont at his finest, so I was reading that stuff. I always liked the Hulk. I was more drawn to the character because I just liked the aspect of you know, someone normal turned into this incredible beast that was a force of nature. I, don't know, I just started reading that stuff. As a child, though, the appeal was the intensity the, or the power. Or what, what was it that drew you in? My God complex at its finest. No. <laughs> he's a unique character in that he's scary. Well, he's he a rebel. A, because he's a force of nature, because he's going to cause destruction even without trying, you know, whether it's because he's been distracted by the military or he's on some sort of rage fest, but he's going to blow everything apart that gets in his way when he's in a horrible state of mm -hmm. mind. So was it that intimidation factor, that fierceness, or was it the outlet for rage, sort of like, because I know Wolverine kind of supplanted Hulk in some ways as a guy who embodied anger and rage. Yeah. I like the concept that the other half, that dark part of your mind that you don't, that you keep so wrapped up and tight and quiet, you, that, that voice you don't, Express, all of a sudden was embodied in him, and then I don't not only him, but it had power, it was stronger than him, and so you had the like I guess your id personality was at full swing, full power, gimme 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 do do do, and so it was kind of cool to read something where most characters were very reserved. You knew you knew they were probably thinking something, but they would never act it out, and the Hulk was the opposite. He acted out what nobody else would do or say. I guess that was really what drew me to him. So it was the psychological text. Yeah, fact, always. This guy had more layers and more depths. Oh yeah, and that's and, and Peter and David. And ability too, I'd imagine, oh, yeah. right? Because I mean, you don't know what's you don't even know which Hulk you're going to get on there. Well, that's, and that's what I said that I really liked with Peter David is, of course, you had all the different Hulks. You might have a run of dumb Hulk and then Grey Hulk and then fix it. You know, the Reverse Hulk or Smart Hulk. So it was always different. It, it never really got boring. Well, and one thing that's good too is with a lot of heroes, they'll have the superficial change. 
here's a black costume. Oh, you're no longer work for the government. Yeah. And a lot of times they, they will only play that out in the short term. You get the sense that, okay, this is going to go on for a story arc or so. Maybe this will go for a year and then it's done. Where with Peter David, when he would make a turn, not only was it a natural turnabout, it wasn't something that was forced by editorial fiat or something, mm-hmm. But you had no idea how long he'd play that out. You know, he could go for years and years. You have whole eras within the Peter David run. As a kid, I remember in high school when we had to read books, one of my favorite mandatory reading was uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That resonates big time in the Hulk book, you know, the whole dual personality. And, of course, that leads back into the thing where I enjoyed the psychological. I really did enjoy story arcs where it had to do more what was going on in the Hulk's mind, this constant battling with himself. I actually own that page where you have Joe Fixit, the Savage Hulk, and Banner all on the head, and they're trying to keep the Savage Hulk locked behind the door. Oh, they I don't love want... that where he's pounding yeah. and they're both kind of freaked out. And they're trying, they're putting, cha- or they're holding the door, trying. So that was a cool thing about Banner was you never knew what Hulk you were going to get. So that's like, you know, like you said, in the Marvel Universe, everyone kind of knew their role. Mr. Fantastic, Iron Man, Cap, everybody had their roles and they were going to stick to them. They might deviate a little bit from it, they're, but they were like pretty the much... They're like ice cream, occasionally they'll throw nuts on it, occasionally they throw women in, but it's still the same. Ice yeah. Cream. You could literally push him to the point where he was a villain at some points in his life. I mean, when he was Joe Fixit, he really was a villain. He wasn't a good guy. He didn't do nice things. I mean, he... Yeah, there's that. <laughs> that yeah. You know, it, I mean, there's many a picture, or there's many artwork of Hulk laying there with multiple women. And they've, they've played that story up, even into the Ultimate Hulk. Well, you know, it does play into the Hulk more than a lot of other characters. True. And it's, and it's not like suave, debonair, Tony Stark, libido. It's this base animal oomph, you know? Yeah. Okay, you went backwards once you got into Peter David. How much further back did you go? Trimp. Herb Trimp? Herb Trimp. Okay. I got about halfway through his world. I never okay, read so the wait, first... Th- so you go back to, like... I got into the 70s stuff, and that was more of the... Kind of like the TV show. They were all more based off of that. Um, which, which live action? Running from the military. The, yeah, the military okay. chasing them. So and more like the 80s and 90s cartoons then. Even the 70s, yeah. Even the 70s one. They, they were all kind of... Well, yeah, I think the 80s was more based on th- that run of comics. It, they didn't really run into any kind of fantastic stories. You know, where, you know, he's going into the microverse and stuff like that till later on. And I was, so you go back to the 70s, but you didn't touch the 60s Tales of the Stone. No, show, not of the really. No, I, like I said, I've, I've read an issue here and there, and it just wasn't my cup of tea. It was, it's just not for me. Captain America was one of those primordial characters for me. I don't remember ever being introduced to him. He was just always around. I had the coloring books, saw the movies on TV. I would see the 60s cartoon. When Spider-Man and his Amazing mm-hmm. Friends came on, he was on a few episodes of that. I saw him there. I had a power record. I had this little suitcase 45 that I would listen to it on, and it was a story of Cap and the Falcon meeting with a character called the Phoenix, who you found out by the end was actually the son of Baron Zemo, which set up him becoming the new Baron Zemo years later. I was always immersed in Captain America stuff. You know, when the action figure came out from the Mego Pocket Heroes, I had that. I had the Secret Wars action figure. Cap was always in my world. But I didn't buy the comic books until, and I made a point of checking on it, it was actually January of 1983. I bought two Captain America comic books. Both of them were written by J.M. DeMatteis. One was drawn by Mike Zek. One was drawn by Carrie Gamble. The Zek one was a Scarecrow appearance, which was very dark. It was actually, you know, Scarecrow feels like more of a Batman villain. Obviously, Batman has his own Scarecrow. It was cool to see Cap in an environment that I wasn't used to because it was a horror story. I think, if I remember correctly, the Scarecrow was killing people and Cap was trying to solve the mystery, so you got to see Cap using his brain. And then in the Marvel team-up story, it was the return of Vermin, who was, again, a fairly dark creation. It was this guy who lived in sewers, he talked to rats, yeah. might have done bad things to people, I don't recall the specifics of it, but it's Cap and Spider-Man in the sewers fighting this rat man with glorious artwork, so it was a great way of getting interested in Cap. Unfortunately, Cap started going through a bad period from that time. I picked up a few more issues of the book, and then I, the main issue was that I loved Mike Zek's artwork, and he left the book and started doing Secret Wars. And his replacement, I believe, was Paul Neary, and it just didn't look very good and the stories Zach could st- sell a bad story better than Paul Neary could and at that time Demetrius was getting involved in a big story arc that was involving a lot of stuff from Cap's past that I wasn't getting into can, so hey, I can, just, can we stop for a second that? can we stop for a second and just establish that you and I have a gigantic man crush on Mike Zach Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like, I'll pretty much buy anything that he does that's Marvel-related. I, w- I wouldn't probably go buy something that 
I had no really care about the characters if it wasn't Marvel-ish related, but, like, yeah, anyway, go for it. Well, I, I will say that the Kingdom was able to break me of that habit, but I did buy some Ultraverse books that would have not been in my collection were it not for Mike Zack, yeah. and I definitely followed him around for quite a number of years. I still have to get a Mike Zack piece at some point in my future. Yeah. So I followed Zack to Secret Wars, and I continued to follow Captain America stories, but always in somebody else's book, because his own just wasn't doing it for me and especially as it got around issue 300 it was the 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 80s version of the old trope of captain america becoming an old man something happens to the super soldier serum and he becomes an old man they do this every so many years they're actually doing it right now in the current comics and i hate that trope i'm not interested in it because all that does to me is reinforce cap as only being the guy with the, the super serum. Soldier serum yeah yeah, it's all about the serum, and I, I, I know that their intention is for him to show his strategic mind, or to show him overcome, and, and see Steve can do stuff, but the fact is Steve can't do stuff, and mostly what you do is you just make him look bad, make him look completely dependent on this artificial device. It's not like he didn't get hit with vitamin rays, it's not like he didn't swell up and become muscular. Even if he shrank down to normal proportions, and wasn't as, as athletic as he was, he could still be a hero, because he'd already overcome the stuff that was keeping him from being Captain America in the first place. You can be a diminished Captain America and still be Cap, but when you're scrawny and old, you're not Captain America anymore. So it pisses me off that I do that. And then J.M. DeMatisse was a guy who was writing I loved, and I continued to follow him over the years, but he left the book after 300, and I believe it was a contentious departure as well. So, you know, Mike Carlin was doing it for a while, and I tried it again when he had a team up with Captain Britain, because it came in one of those three-pack comics. Um, it just didn't do it for me. I'd see a, a comic with Madcap on the cover. I don't want to uh. read this guy interacting with Cap. It's lame. Yeah, I, I finally came back to Cap when Mark Grunewald was doing the book because he had a way of tapping into the 80s zeitgeist between the Scourge of the Underworld and the Terrorists of Ultimatum, the Flag Smasher, Super Patriot, the Commission. It, it was him addressing the 80s and the jingoism that came out of that rebuttal of the guilt felt over Vietnam, all of a sudden everybody was raw, raw, G.I. Joe, Rambo, and he was able to both appropriate that and mingle cap into that so that he seemed cooler while also engaging in a dialogue about how correct it was for that mindset to set in in the 80s under Reagan. So it was really interesting stories, but Grunewald had this problem where if it's a great story, let's try to extend it to, I don't know, 36 friggin' issues. And by the time you've got Cap in a black costume and you've got Johnny Walker running around trying to be Cap and he's brutal and he's a prejudice and all this stuff, I just couldn't get into it. And once Steve became Cap again, it was the same old problem. I love the character, but I don't love the stories the character is appearing in, even though he had some great artwork. You know, Ron Lim did the book for a while. It was a great looking book when he was doing it. I liked, to a degree, Kieran Dwyer. I liked Rick Levins, who, you know, not a very well-remembered creator, but he had some nice stuff. I just, I'm just i a guy who loves the character of Captain America, but I'm one of the least faithful readers of that book has ever had. I, I, I really like really actually the book. I was a huge fan of the Kieran Dwyer stuff. I think we've had a discussion before. I really like Kieran Dwyer's art. I think his cap was really, really good. He was huge. And I mean, what, what was it with the big one of the big storylines they had? I remember Diamondback was running through it because I thought his Diamondback was super hot. Well, I know he did a lot of the stuff with the Commission, the Captain, and uh, Johnny Walker. He did uh, the Bloodstone Hunt. Bloodstone Hunt. Stone. That's what I'm thinking yeah. about, the Bloodstone Hunt. Yeah, and that's another one, too, that was pretty damn cool. A great ending to that one, but it's not something that ever, anybody ever brings up when they're talking about favorite story arcs, but that, that was a pretty nice one. So I remember a scene from there, and I may be totally off base of when the scene was, but I remember Cap fell down a like a booby trap in the floor, and he uses the shield to hit... The, there were spikes on the ground, you know, the typical yeah, hole in the floor. Yeah, I think that was actually spike. a cover. Was it? Right? Yeah. So, so to get himself out, he, he puts his feet through the arm straps and basically does like a leaping reverse dunk grab on the floor and then is able to swing himself up and it was just it was awesome it was super it was like total perfect cap perfect perfect cap i loved it you know, well, Grunewald was definitely one of the best Cap writers, and uh, Dwyer was great at capturing that physicality without making him look like a brute. He, he was big, but he was still a handsome guy. He was still a guy that you could see was the hero as opposed to some steroidal nightmare. I've been talking about the books, but as far as Cap being a favorite character of mine, what I always think back to is when my mother got married and I suddenly had stepsister. One day we were in the park, and my stepsister asked me who my favorite hero was. I thought for half a second, and I said Captain America, and she asked why, and I said, because uh, his costume's blue, and blue's my favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think that was the start of me maybe overthinking superheroes because I realized how dumb that sounded, how poor of rationale that was, and started thinking about more about why I care about the things I care about. It's clear to me now in retrospect, I was looking for male role models, and Cap was one of the first ones that I glommed to. Him and Spider-Man and uh, Batman, these were all guys who were acrobats, who climbed and jumped and flipped and did all kinds of cool stuff that I wanted to be able to do as a kid, but with a grandmother and a mother in the house who made a point of me not being a very physical person and, and would punish me if I got into too much trouble in terms of climbing and jumping and such, uh, I didn't get to do that, so they were getting to do it for me. As I got older and angrier, my role model switched to guys like Wolverine and the Punisher and Grimjack, these darker, more violent characters. But what ends up happening is you get through your teens and you kind of burn through all that anger, and you look back on those characters and you realize they don't have a lot else to offer but darkness and aggression. And so I, you know, I never stopped liking Cap, although I did definitely prefer Wolverine over Cap when they had that big fight in that very famous annual with the Mike Zet cover, where Wolverine's raking his claws across the shield. Yep. I was, I was like, Cap, you can't talk to Wolverine that way at the time. But in retrospect, I came to really dislike Wolverine. I'm not very interested in the Punisher anymore. And much of my interest in that character came from the art of Mike, Mike Zeck, Zeck, Wills Portacio, Jim Lee. Without those guys, I didn't care about those characters anymore. But Cap, even at the nadir of his run, uh, being drawn by guys like Dave Hoover, running around in stupid armor, he still mattered to me as I got older. He, I never stopped caring about that character. As I got to be a better person and a better adult, I and re-embraced those idealistic characters. I re-embraced Captain America because that was a guy that you could aspire to be and be a better person and better relate to the world around you as opposed to just being an asshole with an acid tongue like I had been for much of my teens. Yeah. And I just, I love the basis of the character. It's a gorgeous costume. It's a wonderful design. I love the idea of a character whose main instrument is a shield. He's protecting people. And when you look at Wolverine, Wolverine has foot-long katana blades, three of them, sticking out of each fist, and usually he can't do more than cause flesh wounds and tear people's clothing, but even if he does more than that, all he's doing is hurting, where that shield has so diverse, it has so many different uses, and it's always extremely effective. Another trope that I do get tired of is the shield falling apart or getting broken, but there's a faith that that's always going to be fixed because it's just too great to see Cap blocking up burst of flame and protecting two people behind him or falling from a high place and using the vibranium in the shield to absorb the impact. They even use that in the movies. It's a great visual. The, the frisbee throw and the ricocheting, it's everything about that character I love. And it's a great to have a hero to aspire to be to as opposed to wallowing with these dark anti-heroes. I totally agree. I can see all those points very, very well. Very nicely put, Frank. <laughs> The Zero Edition podcast you just listened to was recorded over a span of weeks on a variety of devices by people who have no great technical competence learning as they go along. I assure you that the podcast quality will improve as we progress. If you're interested in contacting us, we can be reached via Twitter at Rolled Spine. That's R-O-L-L-E-D-S-P-I-N. I-N-E. Our blog is rolledspine.wordpress.com, which is accessible through a link on the Twitter. And uh, you can also send us an email at rolledspinepodcasts, all one word, all lowercase, R-O-L-L-E-D-S-P-I-N-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S at gmail.com. I hope you tune in again. I promise we're going to get better. The Marvel Super Heroes Podcast is in no way affiliated or endorsed by Marvel Entertainment. All characters mentioned and audio clips employed are believed covered under fair use, but remain copyright their respective copyright holders. But of course, the views expressed are wholly owned by the people who spoke them. No infringement is intended. Let's do the theme, let's do the theme to the podcast. Dun, dun, dun. Thor, Iron Man, I'm Captain America, <laughs> Fantastic Four, Obnoxious. Dun, 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 dun. dun. <laughs> <laughs>